Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. If you have your Bible with you, please turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter two of uh, chapter one. So last week we talked about Thanksgiving under tragic conditions. Is it possible to be thankful under Today, we're going to look at Thanksgiving, again, under distress. But of course, this, is, this one's not as horrific, and this one is not as um, outside the, the normal experience of human living as what some have faced. Hannah's Thanksgiving really is more like something that we might face. And again, the question is, is it possible to be thankful under these conditions? So we've been in Psalm 26. We looked at Thanksgiving and and everything that leads up to it. Last week we talked about Thanksgiving under uh, extreme conditions. This week we're going to look at Hannah's Thanksgiving under distress. So if you have your Bible there in chapter 1, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and I'll begin reading. We'll just read a few verses to start us off because I'm just going to travel through this chapter today. And into chapter 2 some. So we'll talk about a great deal of it. But let me just read a little bit here at the beginning. Verse 1. Chapter 1. 1 Samuel. Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the Mount Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah. The son of Jehoram. The son of Elihu. The son of Tohu. The son of Zuf. An Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And the man went up out of his city early, yearly, to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters, portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And, and as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Let's send the reading right there. We'll come back to, uh, to verse 8 in just a minute. But first of all, when we think about Hannah's situation, we have to look at carefully the family dynamic that's going on here. We know who he is. We know what tribe he's of. We know who his fathers and grandfathers are. We know his lineage. As a matter of fact, it's given to us here in 1 Samuel, but we also have it, as the Wednesday night crowd knows, we have it in 1 Chronicles uh, chapter, five, chapter 6, I think. And again, leading up to the birth of Samuel. But this is the family that Hannah is involved in. El- Elkanah is her husband, and he has two wives. First thing we notice about him is that he's a devoted man. You notice that it says there several times, actually, he goes up to the, the, out of his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts. So he's a believer. Elkanah is a believer. He's, he is arranged this particular family in such a way, or at least his life in such a way, that he's worshiping the Lord on a regular basis. And that's, the, that's one of the good things that we can say about Elkanah. You'll notice, though, that right away we have a poor family choice mentioned here. He has two wives, Panina and Hannah. Let me just stop right there and say for a moment that even though we have men in the Old Testament who have multiple wives. Here, Elkanah has two wives. We also have Jacob. Jacob had four wives. David had, I don't know how many wives. And Samuel took it, or Solomon took it to an extreme, a ridiculous extreme, thousands of wives. God is never in that plan. His plan is one man and one woman for a lifetime. Not one man and two women, or one man and three women. We always stop with one. It's a pair. That's the way we have the order in creation. 
That's what we find in the garden. He made a woman. He didn't make three women for Adam. He made one, Eve. That was his wife. That's God's plan. And even though we have men in the Bible who have multiple wives, multiple spouses, whether it's women having men or men having women as wives, it doesn't matter how it works. It is never God's plan. Okay? So the very first thing we see about Elkanah is he's made a choice that is outside of God's will. Having two women, two wives, is not what God wants. So we ha- he has made a poor family choice, and we're going to find out that that poor, poor family choice has created some tension in the home. You'll notice that it says there in, um, let's see, verse 4, when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina and his wife, to all her sons and her daughters, portions. This is a gift that comes from the sacrifice that is made at the altar. Everybody in the family gets a gift from the altar. And so he gives to Penina and, his, and her children. And notice that she has sons and daughters. So there's at least four of them on Penina's side. There's at least two boys and two girls. So there's sons and daughters that Penina has. To all her sons and daughters portions, verse 5, But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. All right. Now you see that there's more... There's more here than just two wives, don't you? He loves one more than the other. And he shows it by giving her a better gift than he gives the rest. And guess who sees that? Panina. And guess who else sees that? Her children. And so Hannah is despised because she's loved more than the mom who's having the children in the family. I don't know about this guy, Elkanah. I like the fact that he's a devoted man and he's a believer. I mean, that's great. But how do you, if you have two wives, do you really say to one, I love you because you're so beautiful, and to the other one, I really like your cooking? Is that what you say? When Christmas time comes, do you say, honey, here's a car for you. Oh, and here's a pot and pan for you, dear. Do you do that? Oh, I don't think Elkan is a very smart fellow, do you? He's showing his love for the one. Well, you know what this reminds me of, and I'm sure it does you too. This reminds me of Jacob. How, how did Leah feel? She's the, one, she's the mom that was having all the children for Jacob. And here's Rachel, and she's not having any children. And, and Jacob loves Rachel. And Leah, well, she's just the other wife. Yeah. Would you like to be, how would you like to be raised in that home, huh? Yeah, I don't think anybody's signing up for that one. How would you like to be the other wife in that home? No, nobody would. So we have an interesting family dynamic here. Two wives, one's loved more than the other, one has children, the other doesn't, and there's tension. Oh, boy, is there tension. Notice, um, let's see, look at verse 5, you know, verse 6. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. See that word adversary there? That word describes panina. And guess what? This is a unique word in the Hebrew Old Testament. We don't find it anywhere else. So the Lord preserves a word just for this situation, just for Penina, this is the adversary. This is the rival wife. And she is, uh, notice that it says there in 6, she is provoking her sore. Now that word provoke is four different times in this particular passage it's being used here. She vexes her. Your translation might have vex. Or your translation might have she made her angry. All the time she's doing that. And you'll notice that it says, and as he did so year by year, she went up to the house of the Lord. So she provoked her. There it is again. Therefore she wept and did not eat. So Penina is provoking. She's vexing. She's making angry Hannah. Can we not imagine how this is going on, how this is happening in the home? These women are fighting. They're really not fighting. Penina is the one who's engaging in the talking down to her and making her feel bad and you're not worthy of the gifts that he gives and I mean we could probably we could probably write a little novella on this little story couldn't we all the nastiness that's going on between these two women 
And it's because Elkanah made a poor choice. And you know something else you'll notice in this passage, and it's in verse, it's here in verse 5, and it's also in verse 6. Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. That's, not, that's the first time, shut up her womb. The Lord had shut up her womb. And then you'll notice it again in verse 6, because the Lord had shut up her womb. So not only did she have an adversary in the home, but she apparently had an adversary in the Lord, because the Lord hadn't blessed her with children, which is the thing she wanted. She was being uh, talked bad about in the home because she hadn't had any children, because he loved her, and because she was the one that wasn't having children and so they talk bad about her. She's a waste. She's a, you know, she's a problem. She's taking up space. What good is this woman, Hannah, in my house? So, you know, you see that. And she's not only hearing that from Panina, but the Lord is, has not given her children. And she wants to know why. So the Lord seems to be against her in this situation. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then is verse 8. We didn't read verse 8. I wanted to save it. Verse 8, then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not, and why is thine heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? Are you that self-centered? I think what we got going on here in Elkanah's mind is just a little bit of narcissism. He thinks he's that grand. Look at the questions. Could you, do you really ask her these questions? Why don't you eat? Why do you weep? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not? And he knows why. Notice what he says. Am I not better to you than ten sons? He knows exactly why she's grieved. She knows that he knows exactly why she's hurt, why she's vexed. She knows that he knows exactly what's going on. And then he has the nerve, the gall to say, am I not better than? The answer is, no, you're not. So not only is this fellow made a poor choice, not only does he have this infighting going on in his house, not only from Penina, but I'm certain of her children as well. Not only do we have that, not only is she wondering why the Lord won't bless her, but then we have this narcissistic, selfish man. And of course, I think to have two wives, you have to be just a little bit narcissistic to think that you can handle two wives. Says to her, am I not better? What? Are you kidding me? He would actually say that to her? Like I said, the family dynamic, we need to take a little time to talk about that because this is a dandy. Boy, you talk about Peyton Place. Well, we could, you know what? We should pitch this to the television. Well, they would love something like this, wouldn't they? Two wives and this infighting going on. One's loved more than the other. Well, this makes good television drama, doesn't it? And this this guy who's clueless and he thinks that he's the one, the selfishness of Elkanah is just... That like the cherry on the top, or the straw that broke the camel's back. Here it is, really. So a selfish husband, a hateful, a hateful rival wife in Panina and her children, and she doesn't know why the Lord has not given her children. I mean, she's got all this going on. And I think right here in verse 9, we reach the tipping point. Let's look at verse 9. So Hannah rose after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by a post of the temple of the Lord. She gets up. I wonder if this conversation didn't happen while they're eating the fellowship meal there at the tabernacle. I just wonder if maybe he doesn't say to her in his, his just disgust of the entire situation, Am I not better to you than ten sons? And she just gets up from the table and walks off. She has reached the point of no return. Her distress is that deep. Some people, when you are on the knife's edge, some people respond in different ways. Some go into despair. This is the I can't crowd. I won't crowd. This is the I never, this is the, these are the folks that never have a positive thing to say. They're just, they've just come to the end of the rope and nothing is right. Nobody is right. They're not right. 
it's just darkness everywhere. Well, this is, this is Eeyore's story, you know, with the little cloud over his head. Because they've reached the tipping point and they, they slip off the knife's edge into despair. And that is a dark and bottomless pit. You all know that. That's a bad place to be. The other folks who slip off the knife's edge slip into bitterness. Everybody's against me. Nobody likes me. It's always somebody else's problem and never my own. And so they're angry all the time and they're bitter and their words are even laced with bitterness and anger because of something that somebody did somewhere in the past and they just keep multiplying that in their minds and thinking about it and thinking about it and thinking about it. And so every relationship comes out bitter because they can't get past that first hurt so long ago. And it just colors everything that happens to them. Despair and bitterness. That's one side of the knife's edge when you get to the tipping point like Hannah came to. She's got it in her home. She's got it with her, with her devotion. She's got it with her husband. She's got no body, no body that she can look to and ask for help. No relief anywhere. It's just dark. But thankfully for us, Hannah gives us another option. She doesn't slip off into despair, and she doesn't slip off into bitterness. She slips off the other side of the knife's edge, and she goes to the Lord. She runs to him. She casts herself at his feet. Now, in verse 9, it says that Eli's there. He's sitting by the post of the tabernacle. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Let me tell you something. When you've got nobody else to go to and everybody else is playing a game and everything else is darkness and there's no hope, there's no light anywhere in your life, there is still one place. There is still one thing to resort to. There is still one shelter to go to. And that is to call upon the name of the Lord. And that's exactly what this lady does. That's why I say it's fortunate for us that we don't see her go into bitterness or go into um, despair. What we see her do is run to the Lord. And look how honest it is. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She just, man, she, Hannah just lays it all out. She just spits it all out. Just blah. Here it is. Don't you, can't you hear that prayer? That she's praying to him. Verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah had, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved. But her voice was not heard, therefore Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away the wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Could not, could not thine handmaiden, count not thine handmaiden for a daughter of Belial. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Things are bad at the tabernacle. Hannah has to confront Eli, and Eli thinks he's confronting Hannah. We know about Hophni and Phinehas. If you look over into chapter uh, chapter 2, uh, chapter 2 tells us about the, the bad things that are going on with Hophni and Phinehas, and it's just an ugly scene that's happening at the tabernacle. Things have retrograded. They have gone backwards. The worship of the Lord had been tainted by the sin, sinfulness of those two boys. And so maybe Eli is just, he's gotten used to this kind of abuse happening there at the tabernacle. And he sees Hannah on her knees over here and her mouth's moving. And he thinks, oh, we got another drunk one. Isn't that horrible? And he has to go over there to rebuke her. Hannah has to push through one more vexing. And she does it because of the crimes of others, not because of her own crime. 
Eli thinks she's drunk. She's not drunk. And so she has to explain herself to the high priest. How come she can't go to the temple and pray without having to explain herself? But things have gotten that bad at the tabernacle. It's that ugly. It's that dark. And here's a woman who's actually praying. And Eli thinks that it's something else. Sometimes, you know, when you get to that place, when you get to that place of the tipping point, you know, that knife's edge, where you can go off into bitterness, or you can go off into despair, or you can go seek the Lord. You know, when you decide to go seek the Lord, you still have an enemy. He's intractable. And guess what he wants to do? He wants to pull you off of this, because he'd rather see you over here in despair's dark pit, or bitterness's dark pit, than to see you calling on the name of Jesus. And he'll come to you, even in the tabernacle. And so Eli walks over to him and says, stop drinking. Why are you drunk? Put away your wine. Hannah, does she get angry at that? She's already at the bottom. She's already without any hope. So what does she do? She just explains it. She says, no, I'm not drunk. I'm just sorrowful. I have a spirit that is sorrowful. She says there in verse 15, I've not drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but... I'm pouring out my soul before the Lord. What a wonderful, beautiful sound that is. To pour out a sorrowful spirit before the Lord. Because he hears that. Oh man, woman, whoever you are. Do you have hurts? I know you do. You have fears and you have worries? I know you do. Don't slip off into bitterness or despair. Go now and seek the Lord. Yes, you have an enemy, and you're going to have an enemy until you draw your last breath. And he's going to try to knock you off your devotion. He's going to try to knock you out of your service to the Lord. Don't let him. You just keep on, and you just tell the truth. Sorrowful spirit, yes. Pouring it out, yes. That's what's true, and you know who hears that? The Lord hears that. He's not afraid of your sorrow. He's not afraid of your concern. He wants you to come to him with those things and just spill it out before him. Oh, Hannah, what a great example she is. Eli, when he hears the truth from Hannah, don't you know he must have been ashamed that he even thought such a thing. But it had just gotten so bad he didn't know how else to react. Eli answered and said, here is verse 17, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat. Uh Uh-oh, well, something's changed. Before she couldn't eat, she was so vexed by Penina's attacks. But now she does eat. Look at that. She went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. What happened? As the old fellow said, what happened? Something happened there. Something happened when she prayed. Something happened when Eli said, go in peace. The Lord's going to answer your prayer. Something happened. Hannah acts like Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's almost like she has a faith revelation right there at the tabernacle. Suddenly her prayer, she knows God, here's my prayer. The high priest just said, go and the Lord answer your prayer. That's what I want. I want him to answer my prayer. And she goes back. She says, hey, hey, you got any of that steak left? I'd like a piece. Give me them mashed potatoes. Send them carrots over here. Come on. Let's eat now. And she's different. And she goes home. She's not sad. Things have changed. She goes from a sorrowful spirit to a contented spirit like that. Why? Faith. Faith in what? Faith in the fact that God heard her prayer and the high priest said, Go in peace. The Lord has heard your prayer. Oh, suddenly. Suddenly faith is moving mountains. Suddenly, faith is generating something new in this woman now who couldn't eat before. Now she does. In this woman now who wasn't contented before, but now she is. She's no more sad, it says. And what happens? They go home, and the prayer is answered. 
Look at verses 19 through 28. And they rose up in the morning early and worshipped before the Lord. I bet they did. I bet you Hannah said, no, one more time. We, got it. we need to go back. Because she is rejoicing in the thought that my prayer has been answered. So she's already thanking the Lord here. She goes back and they worship before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. There it is. There it is. The Lord remembered her. And do you know what? That's the thing that Hannah wanted. She could, all she could hear was Eli's promise. All she could think of was my prayer is answered. And guess what? The Lord remembered and blessed the girl so that she could have children. Before you hear angels singing, remember that this answer comes in the home of Elkanah. And Panina is still there. And her children are still there. And that selfish man is still there. All those elements are still in place. The thing that changed is not Panina, not her children, and not Elkanah. The thing that changed was Hannah. That's what changed. Hannah changed not because of Hannah, but because she put faith in the promise. There, ladies and gentlemen, is the change. But everything else in that home remains the same. It's just exactly as they left it. All the furniture is in the same places. The beds are made in the same way. It's all decorated just as they left it. Everything is the same when they get back. The people are the same. The attitudes are the same. Everything, condition-wise, is the same, except for the heart of a young lady who believed. And now things really begin to change. Because she conceives. She didn't hear any longer the sniping and the griping and the dirty words and the bitterness and the hateful speech of Panina. She didn't anymore remember the selfishness of her husband. Suddenly all she could hear was the promise of Eli. The prayer that she prayed wasn't for an abundance of children Rather, it was to be remembered by the Lord, and he did. And the result was the exaltation of God, not the enjoyment of a gift. Look at her prayer just over here in chapter 2. Just turn over there with me real quick, and with this I'll close out. Look at her prayer. Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices. Actually, The word prayer is all over this passage. This is not really much of a prayer, is it? This is more of a joy, joyful shouting song, isn't it? This is a this is a you know, get out the tambourine and and beat on the beat on the drums kind of thing. It's it says she prayed, but I just wonder if maybe she wasn't kind of dancing as she did it. My heart rejoices in the Lord, mine horn is exalted in the Lord, my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. We know who those are. Because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord. For there is none beside thee. Neither is any rock like our God. Talk no more of it so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken. And they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired them out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that, ha- and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich, he bringeth low and lifteth up. Do you see what she's saying in this? Do you hear this? What's this about? Is this about Hannah? Is this about the gift that she's given? No, this is about the excellency of God, who she prayed to. This is about the wonder of the Lord. This is who the Lord is. He kills and makes alive. He makes poor and makes rich. He raises up the poor out of the dust, lifts up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. And Hannah knows this how? Because she had no strength, she had no hope, and she had only one place, only one recourse, only one shelter, only one switch to pull, and it was the name of the Lord. And she went to that tabernacle that night after that meal, and she poured out her sorrowful heart to the Lord God and said, just remember me, just remember me. And the priest came along and said, go in peace. 
the Lord hear your prayer. The Lord hear your prayer. So when you give thanks this week, are you going to thank him for all the bounty of your table? Because every one of us is going to have a bountiful table. We always do. I don't know how that always happens. We did this past Sunday when we had our Thanksgiving meal here. Always more food than we can eat. Are you going to thank him for that? Are you going to thank him for the people that are gathered around your table? For those children, those grandchildren, that husband, that wife, that daughter, that son, that uncle, that aunt, that grandparent. Are you going to thank God for that? Are you going to thank him for the house that you have that table in and the shelter that he's provided? Are you going to thank him for the fine clothing that you wear? You could thank him for all of these things. But how about this, this Sunday or this Thursday when you have Thanksgiving? How about you thank God for him? For who he is. Not for what he's done. But for just the fact that he's the sovereign God over all things. That no man has any strength. No man has any ability. There is nothing in this world that happens apart from the working of his hand. And you see, that's what the Lord wanted to get Hannah to. Yes, in the beginning, he was her adversary. Because he wasn't, he wasn't actually being an adversary to her, but he was moving her to the place of thanksgiving. He was giving her an opportunity to go and seek his face. She had, and she had an adversary in the home. She had a selfish husband. There was children there that were bothering her and, and beating her about the ankles. What does she do? She goes and she seeks the Lord. This whole thing has been orchestrated by the Lord so that he could get glory for himself in the life of one little girl who lived in a home in Ramah, in Israel, a long time ago. The Lord is the one. He killeth and maketh alive. He maketh poor and maketh rich. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifts up the beggar from the dunghill. He will keep the feet of his saints. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces out of heaven. Shall he thunder upon them? The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. What do you give thanks for? So this morning, Hannah, our example here, chapter 1, chapter 2, is calling all the Hannahs to pray. That's me. That's you. No matter who you are, no matter how old you are, no matter where you are, he's, she's calling all Hannahs to pray. Don't fall off into bitterness or despair. Look to the Lord and patiently wait on him. Listen to the words of the psalmist here. Psalm 27, verse 14. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.